Excellent. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. Today's video is gonna be some follow-up testing, benchmarking, Q&A, and all that good stuff about my July build, which is right here. It's a $1,200 build. It's made for mid to high-end PC gaming. It's also totally VR capable. It's also got a really nice black and red color scheme. And I was going for not like the cheapest build I could get, but reasonable parts. Parts that I know you can overclock, I know that we're gonna perform well, I know you're gonna get a lot of lifespan out of, and uh, ultimately I'm really really happy with how the build turned out. So starting off with what I liked about this build is that everything is pretty much off the shelf. There was no modding or customization that was needed to be done with this build. I didn't even need to dig into my own personal collection of like random little PC components and cables and connectors and stuff to put anything together. Everything you see here was used from all the stuff that came in the boxes with all the parts that I have listed in the build list parts list down in the description so check that out if you're interested in any of these parts individually or there's a PC part picker build list where you can see everything all together with a price point still right around $1,200. I also really like how everything turned out with the color scheme since I chose the EVGA power supply with the all black cables. There's nothing really that stood out as garish or not fitting in with the rest of the color scheme of this build. So that was nice too. Finally, I like that it's all air cooled. Uh, we got the Cryo Rig H7 cooler up here and of course air cooled graphics card as well. And there's not gonna be any worries here about uh, a pump failing in the future or leaks happening. Granted, liquid coolers are nice and I've done a lot of liquid cooling in the past, but there's something to be said for just a nice Simple air-cooled system, especially when you're not paying 100 bucks plus for a liquid cooler, since the uh, Cryorig H7, H7 only costs about $35. On the downside though, there were a couple things that were less than perfect, and I will start out with a bit of a mistake or just an oversight on my part, and that is when it comes to the motherboard. Now this is a very solid motherboard from MSI, the uh, Z178 Gaming M3, and it's more reasonably priced. It's less than $150, most of the places that you look. However, the Amazon listing for this motherboard, which is what I first checked out, and blindly accepted the uh, thing down here, which is, wait, where did it go? Multi-GPU support. This, this motherboard supports SLI and Crossfire, it says here on the Amazon product page. If you scroll down a little bit further, though, it's got a comparison of the M7, M5, and M3, and you'll find that it's actually only Crossfire X two-way support. The reason for that is that the uh, second by 16 PCIe slot on this motherboard is only wired up for by four. It's physically full length, but it's wired up for by four. So rather than being able to get by eight and by eight when you have two cards installed, it actually will still do by eight and by four. And by four is not enough for official SLI support from NVIDIA. I think that's probably a segmentation thing that MSI did intentionally with this motherboard. And for most people, it's probably not gonna be an issue since most people don't end up doing SLI configurations. That's pretty rare. But I wanted to point that out here in case any of you guys were thinking, I'm gonna buy this build, wait three, four, or six months or something, and then grab another 1070. Definitely double check that motherboard choice. And to give you guys a little bit better uh, idea of just how minor the change actually is, if you can find a slightly more reasonable, reasonably priced 1070, like here's the 1070 Gaming 8G, it's not the Gaming X or whatever. This one is supposed to be 20 bucks or so cheaper than the uh, than the one that I chose. Here it is on Newegg where it's actually listed properly, but hey look, it's even in stock right now, really? That's insane. Anyway, 440 bucks. So you can save, you know, 10 or 20 bucks by getting not the gaming X version of the, of the GPU. And then uh, I went over here and did another PC part picker list where you can see uh, dropping the price of the uh, GPU down a little bit, like down to 430 or something, which I did with the 1078 gig card, which is not black and red and wouldn't, anyway, I, I'm doing this more for proof of concept, but anyway, a slightly cheaper 1070 and a slightly more expensive motherboard. This is the uh, gaming M5, which has 170 bucks as opposed to 150. And the price is still roughly the same, $1,212, at least if you're buying in the United States. And yes, my sympathies are with any of you guys in the comments who posted that like, wow, this deal is sure a deal in the US. Here in my country, it's exponentially more, or maybe not exponentially, but it feels that way. One other thing I will point out when it comes to negatives, and this one was really minor, but a few people did point out in the comments that I did not take these uh, power cables and route them straight down because there is a gap here uh, for the S340 that allows pretty clean uh, routing of those cables. These are actually two individual six pin or uh, six pin plus six pin peg connectors, or at least eight pin plus. They're, they both have two plugs on the end with the daisy chain thing on the end. And I really hate how that looks when it comes to this right here. So I routed them both up here. And I'll show you guys a closer look, but I actually have a Velcro strap here holding back those extra two plugs that come off of either one. So from the front here and from the look through the window, it looks pretty clean, but th there's actually a bit of a, a 
bubble right here in the middle of it, so not ideal. That's just how the uh, cabling came from EVGA. You could you could like mod the cables and snip those off if you really wanted to. I've done that before, but I didn't want to do anything that would void a warranty or that kind of thing. Anyway, let's move on to uh, some actual testing. I did overclocking, temperature testing, noise testing. Uh, first off, overclocking. All right, so my uh, 6600K got up to 4.4 gigahertz with pretty much no problems at all. Didn't even have to touch the voltage. Uh, motherboard automatically juiced it up to about 1.275 volts, which is perfectly reasonable. That's about what I would expect most people could get out of a 6600K without too much trouble. I could probably have pushed it to 4.5 or 4.6, but again, I wanted to keep things reasonable for folks who are trying to sort of replicate this build. For temperatures, with the CPU at stock, uh, with the ambient temperature around 26 to 28 degrees Celsius, my uh, CPU was idling at 26 to 29 Celsius. Uh, and while I was gaming, it hit 52 degrees Celsius. I then uh, added in the overclock, 4.4 gigahertz again. Idling jumped up a little bit, but it was still pretty minimal. Uh, 29 to 32 degrees Celsius was what I was monitoring at. 68C was what it got up to while gaming. And then when I did an IDIS 64 stress test, it hit 82C, um, which is, you know, warmer than it would run at stock, but still well within range of what I would accept for a gaming overclock, especially with a uh, pretty simple and inexpensive air cooler in there. As far as GPU temps, I didn't uh, overclock the GPU since I just used the MSI OC mode that it comes with uh, or is available with the MSI software, but uh, GPU was idling at 55C and that's with the fans not spinning, spinning at all, so making no noise. Uh, and then while gaming, the max I uh, got up to with the side panel on and after gaming for a long period of time was 72 degrees Celsius. Also, well within range, very cool for a GTX 1070. So this build overclocks beautifully and temperatures are very reasonable. What about noise? Listen for yourself. If you guys can hear, the fans are spinning. But when I'm at a reasonable distance, it's, you can't really hear anything. Let's move on to some testing. We'll start off with 3D Mark tests. Uh, these are of course canned benchmarks, so that runs them and I get a score. Fire Strike Extreme hit 8,063 overall and 9,028 on the graphics. Switching up to Fire Strike Ultra hit 4,407 overall and 4,457 with the graphics. Then I uh, threw Time Spy on there. That's the new DirectX 12 benchmark from 3D Mark. Overall score was 5,764. Graphics score was 6,043 and the CPU score was 4,570. Again, I'm running all these tests with the overclock enabled on the CPU. And now let's move on to some game testing. I'm going to be doing Doom with Vulcan, uh, GTA 5, Metro Last Light, and Overwatch. And I'm running all these tests at 2560 by 1440 because I feel like that's probably the resolution that would be the sweet spot for this particular build. Finally, I did grab a couple questions from the comments section on the video, uh, the original build video, of course. Uh, this one's from John Stewart. Will a 500 watt power supply be enough for this build? I created it on PC Part Picker. It only needed 376 watts. I was wondering if I went overkill. Uh, this is slight overkill, but I always like to go a little bit more than what is expected 
for the power supply. Most graphics cards are where you'd look for your minimum wattage requirement, so usually it's around 500 or 550 watts for most modern GPUs, sometimes as low as 450, or even less if you're getting a lower end one. Uh, I like having overhead though, I like having extra room in case I want to expand. Of course, I already mentioned the potential SLI snafu with this build, but if you were going, for instance, dual 480s, for example, or you did upgrade that motherboard to the M5 version and you did go SLI, you would want a bit of extra power available, and then you wouldn't have to swap out the entire PSU and all that kind of thing. That said, just make sure you get something quality. Make sure you get something that's well reviewed. Uh, Johnny Guru Tech Power Up, really good uh, reviews for power supplies. They need to be well built because even if you're looking at a PC part picker uh, build and it's saying, oh, you need this many watts, you also have to deal with potential spikes. Often when you first power up a computer, for example, it can spike and draw a lot more wattage than sort of the minimum or, or mean value that you would get. That's probably not the right usage of that term, but it can spike up a lot. So that's why you want to have a little bit of extra headroom. That said, 500 watts, you should still be fine with this uh, build as long as you're not going for uh, SLI or an extremely inexpensive power supply. Next question from Bass Player. Why use an air cooler on the CPU? Water is cheap and better and quieter. Um, a good point. Water cooling is definitely something that's fun and can get you lower temperatures and even some better overclocking depending on the situation. But air cooling does have its benefits as well. So um, air cooling, for example, never has the potential to have a pump fail. If you've ever, ever had a pump fail on an all-in-one liquid cooler, it can be a pain in the ass. If the pump fails and you don't find out about it, your CPU can overheat and just automatically shut down your system. And if you're in a situation like I've been in the past and you're in the middle of booting, for example, you can like lose a RAID array or that kind of thing. That has happened to me and a few other people I know. Also, liquid coolers do have the potential to leak. Granted, that's rare, but that is something that's possible. Air coolers can fail, but if the fan fails on an air cooler, uh, the fan just stops working. The air cooler heat sink and everything still works, so you won't have quite as catastrophic a failure as you would if you had a pump failure on a liquid cooler, so that's one of the good reasons to go with it. I mean, there's benefits, pros and cons to either side, but hey, that's why we make videos on the internet about building computers. That is all for this video, though. If you guys enjoyed it, of course, hit the thumbs up button and let me know you enjoyed. I'm going to be doing this again next month, so just in a few more days, it's going to be August. I'll be doing August builds very soon, so stay tuned to my Twitter and my YouTube channel for those, and as always, thank you for watching.